Hello, everyone, and welcome to Southeastern 14. I am Blaine Gilmer, and we are here covering the 10 SEC offensive coordinator hires this offseason. Uh, man, a time of drastic change when it comes to the SEC in terms of who's going to be calling the plays. Well, in some cases, uh, sometimes you're going to see some old faces that are back in these schools, and then also there are some new additions to staffs completely. So excited to be bringing you that today. Make sure go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit the like, turn on notifications for all the stuff that comes on Southeastern 14, basketball, baseball, and football all year round. But without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. We're going to do a countdown, number 10 all the way down through number one. And we're going to start off number 10 being Kirby Moore, uh, for Missouri, listen. Um, I'm not. I'm going to go ahead right off the bat and say all of these guys, all of these coordinators, know more football, have forgotten more football than I'll ever know. Okay, but you got to compare these relatively to what the standard is in college football today. Kirby Moore, first time coordinator at Fresno State last year, one year of calling plays, been a wide receiver coach there, at Washington. Uh, at Fresno State and at Washington before coming to the staff with Eli Drinkwitz and, and people at Missouri over there. So I just think he's got a lot to lot to prove uh, year one. And, you know, they lost Dominic Lovett to the transfer portal to, to Georgia. Um, going to have to see what happens at that quarterback position. Is Sam Horn going to finally make his way in? Brady Cook did some good things towards the end of last year. But I've got Kirby Moore at number 10, just a lot to – Prove and listen. Anytime you got a guy as the head coach, like Eli Drinkwitz is, who's who's relinquishing control somewhat, maybe begrudgingly, right? Because he's got to be more of a CEO type deal with the way college football is now, with the NIL and the transfer portal and all that kind of stuff. Um, I do know one thing: Kirby Moore will serve himself well if he gets the ball to Luther Burden as much as he possibly can. Number nine, Dow Loggins. Listen. Uh, this is just not a real exciting hire, okay? Yes, he's got NFL experience. He's been around. Um, he was the offensive coordinator for the Jets back in 2019. But, man, they were not very good that year offensively. They were 31st in total offense in the NFL out of out of 32 teams. And, and it's just uh, not a real exciting hire. Don't tell that to Shane Beamer, okay, because uh, he – was going after the media, to, you know, tooth and nail, saying that Dow Loggins was his guy the entire time. Maybe that's the case. Maybe it's not. Uh, I know that there's been, you know, some things in his past in terms of the style of offense that he does. He's going to have to do a lot of changing, I think, to get people in Columbia there excited about this hire. So I've got Dow Loggins at number nine for South Carolina. Number eight, Kevin Barbe goes to Mississippi State. Okay, uh, listen, long-term, if this was a long-term deal, if this wasn't for just 2023, I would probably have Kevin Barbe uh, ranked higher. Okay, what he did at App State last year with the condensed formations, with the pre-snap motions, with the two backs in the backfield, a lot of misdirection, things like that, I love it. I think the, the style of offense is tremendous. I hope he – brings that to Mississippi State, but you're talking about a big adjustment going from air raid to what that style of offense is uh, that, that Kevin Barbe's run. I know that he's probably going to try to marry up the two and things like that, but you're talking about getting offensive linemen really more coming off the ball, getting more vertical on double teams instead of instead of the true uh, true – zone concept and then the the vertical pass set stuff so this is going to be more hard nose more downhill right at you but when it comes down to it will rogers and company they're they're used to a totally different style they yes they have all off season i'm going to put kevin barbe at number eight right now go with joey hazel number seven for tennessee listen it's it's nothing against you know Joey Hazel, and I know Tennessee fans will be all up in arms. Well, he's been with uh, he's been with Heupel for you know fifteen of the last seventeen years, and all of this kind of stuff. Yeah, he's been there. He's never been the guy calling the plays. Brand new experience uh, for him. If in fact 
that Heupel does let him call the plays. Listen, when you got a guy like Josh Heupel, who's such a brilliant offensive mind, I don't know how much it matters um, how much who your offensive coordinator is. I don't think uh, that it's that consequential of, of a hire either way. It was done more for, for continuity purposes, bringing him in, um, being able to keep all that terminology the same. He's worked with quarterbacks, things like that. Uh, long term, I can see Joey Hazel if he if he'll stick around in Tennessee, being a guy who really does get to control that offense. Because as as I said, um, as college football is today with NIL and transfer portal and all that kind of stuff, a head coach really needs to be putting all of his attention uh, into into the roster management type of things and and just running these massive programs now. But I'm going to put Joey Hazel at number seven. Number six, Tommy Reese, Alabama. Uh, listen, I'm not I'm not tremendously uh, excited about this hire for Alabama. He was the fourth choice uh, for Nick Saban. Nick Saban tried to go get uh, Grubb from Washington. Um, you know, tried to get Joe Moorhead from Akron. He tried to get Freddie Kitchens, who you know was helped at South Carolina and was the offensive coordinator for the Cleveland Browns not too long ago, and then lands on Tommy Reese. Um, Tommy Reese is going to try to bring some more physicality back to that Alabama program, get get to running the football more. He's got two good young running backs in Justice Haynes and and uh, Richard Young to be able to, to do that with. The problem is the offensive line doesn't necessarily marry up right now with the scheme that Tommy Reese is going to bring in there, being able to be, you know, and have more tight ends, more, more just get – downhill and really come after you type more balanced offense than Alabama has had. They've been a little bit more pass happy, a little bit more explosive on the outside lately, but Tommy Reese is going to try to change that. But here's the thing. I just don't know how this is going to fit. This is a guy that relatively hasn't done anything yet. And Nick Saban has a very high expectations and he does not mind, you know, chewing out guys who have won uh, national titles, have been head coaches before, all that kind of stuff. None of this stuff that Tommy Reese uh, has done. So now he's got to go, you know, from uh, a job in, in Notre Dame where he had carte blanche, was able to do whatever he wanted, and now he's going to be doing exactly what Nick Saban wants him to do. It, make no mistake, this is going to be in Nick Saban's terminology. This is going to be in Nick Saban's style of, uh, of how he wants things done. So that's going to be an adjustment for Tommy Reese. And also that offensive line has got to – has got to grow and got to get more improved. Javin Cohen out had a, had a uh, you know, they lost the right tackle transfer from Vanderbilt last year um, who started for him. And if you look at the two deep this year, literally at every position for Alabama is either going to be a freshman starting or a key backup, the immediate backup for Alabama. So a lot of youth on that offensive line. So we'll see how things end up turning out, but I've got Tommy Reese at number six. Number five, I've got Dan Enos to Arkansas. Uh, listen, I really, really think that a lot of people, especially the Arkansas faithful, might be underselling this, this hire by Sam Pittman. Sam Pittman was the offensive line coach for Dan Enos the first time he was there back in 2015. They, they set records in terms of rushing touchdowns. Um, I really, really like – where Enos has been in his track record. Listen, there's mixed success like Miami in 2019, not so great, but he was also the quarterback coach for Alabama in 2018. Okay, he's, he's got a good track record in terms of what he's able to do, getting guys in space, creating explosive plays. Even at Maryland the last two years, uh, uh, Talia Tungavailoa has had great numbers, and they've averaged – been. Uh, fourth in scoring in the Big Ten, Maryland, the last couple of years with Enos calling the plays over there. So I think this is a much better hire than people realize. I like Dan Enos to to come in there and get things uh, going after the offense was a little bit stagnant last year for the Razorbacks. I'm going to go with Mike Bobo at number four. Listen, there's there's been certainly some, some mixed uh, emotions about the Bobo hire from the Georgia fan base. Um, Listen, here's the thing. Back in 2014, Mike Bobo helped Georgia put up the highest averaging offense it's ever had, 41.3 points per game. 
And the level of talent that Mike Bobo had then does not even compare to what this roster is now for Georgia. And the last time I checked, Kirby Smart is still the head coach at the University of Georgia. Todd Munkin was a you know wizard and was able to do a lot of really, really good things schematically to get Georgia going. But there is not a big drop off this year in terms of the talent returning and things like that. You got three offensive linemen returning, a couple of really good tight ends, three backs that have a lot of experience and a, and a fourth that was coming off injury that should be there that should help contribute and Andrew Paul. And then arguably the receiving core has never been deeper. You got guys transferring in like Dominic Lovett and Ra Ra Thomas. And that's addition to uh, the Lad McConkeys that are already there that have had a bunch of experience. Um, Arian Smith, who may be the fastest player in college football out there. He, he, I think this, this hire is going to specifically say, okay, we're going to give give him a little bit more of a chance is what Georgia will say with that. And Mike Bobo, who is, listen, known for back, back when Aaron Murray was the quarterback, Matt Stafford, they're going to take shots and they're going to get the ball down the field, um, whether it's Carson Beck, Brock Vandergriff, or Gunnar Stockton. So I think just because of the roster and the program status alone, Mike Bobo can't fall any farther than fourth in this ranking of offensive coordinator hires. Philip Montgomery, number three at Auburn. People are like, really? You're going to put him at number three? Yeah, here's why. Eight years head coaching experience back at, at Tulsa. You marry that with Hugh Freeze and his offensive mind already there. Just a good compliment to be able to balance each other out because Hugh Freeze Listen, he's going to be directly involved in this offense, but there's just so much going on, as I said, with uh, in, the, in the case of, of Tennessee, you know, and the case of Missouri with these head coaches now not being able to really call their, their own stuff exclusively and, and just focus t- totally in on the offense with the, the NIL, the transfer portal, everything pulling you in different direction, fundraising. So having Philip Montgomery, a guy who's been a head coach before, who's done things in a, in a, in versatile ways at Tulsa offensively. Um, even this past season, you saw them go to Ole Miss and they were more of a passing, happy, you know, pass happy attack going into that game. Their, their starting quarterback gets hurt. They switch and have more of a running quarterback situation in that game and, and took Ole Miss to the limit. So I really like Philip Montgomery at Auburn, number three. I think he's going to bring – uh, some versatility, some creativity, and most importantly, that head coaching experience to back up where Hugh Freeze, um, you know, has to put his attention elsewhere. Bobby Petrino, number two, Texas A&M. Listen, Texas A&M's offense just has been stagnant. West Coast style offense, uh, short dink and dunk. That's not going to be the case with Bobby Petrino. He's he's a master at being able to take the the offensive weapons a team has and being able to scheme explosive plays down the field you got moose muhammad you got evan stewart who could be one of the top receiving dynamic duos in the sec this year i think connor wegman has the arm to to push the ball down the field and it's something that bobby petrino is not shy about doing and of course when you create those those put that stress on the defense not only all 53 to third yards wide but also uh you know down the field as well it's going to create some some gaps in the run game there so uh got a nice smith back so listen there's a lot to to be excited about if you're texas a and I i know that is uh kind of funny funny to say with maybe the direction that program's been going but bobby petrino at number two is who i like and that leaves us one guy left on the new hire list and that's liam cohen listen they dropped off 12 points per game uh, on average when Liam Cohen left from 2021 season, went back to the Rams where he's working with Sean McVay for 2022. Rich Scangarello came in and it just wasn't, it just wasn't the same, uh, same type of dynamic offensively. The offensive line didn't play as physically. I think they're the, Part of that was because of new terminology, some hesitation, uh, things going on there, not necessarily knowing um, knowing the offensive scheme as well as they had under Cohen. I think Cohen's a great teacher of what he's able to do. You know, 
listen, a lot of that, a lot of that stretch, get the ball to the outside on the perimeter, whether it's through jet sweeps, whether it's through screens, whether it's through the, the, the outside zone, the mid zone that's going to stretch out wide, even even more some some pin and pull type stuff to get that ball out to the perimeter. Liam, Liam Cohen is going to attack the perimeter in a masterful way, and now he's got a tremendous amount of talent to do it with. Okay, Devin Leary is is maybe the most pure passer of the football coming in to the SEC this year from NC State. Also, you got Ray Davis, who is a is a quality running back. But on the outside, I'm really excited about what Kentucky is going to be able to do with Barry and Brown. That speed, you talk about getting him on those jet sweeps, those quick screens in the perimeter, that could be dangerous. Tavion Robinson comes back, bringing a wealth of experience from his time at both Virginia Tech and then also being at Kentucky last year. And then Dane Key did some exciting things. Liam Cohen and Devin Leary with that triumvirate of – uh, of wide receivers, Ray Davis in the backfield. They bring in a couple key transfers to help sure up that offensive line. I really like that hire for Kentucky at offensive coordinator, and he's my number one top hire uh, of the offseason heading into the 2023 season in terms of offensive coordinators. Listen, guys, if you like the content here, make sure you like, make sure you subscribe, make sure you turn on notifications. We go live sometimes, Chris and Blake, talking about basketball content. Baseball season is in full full throw here. So, brothrow.com, check it out. You can take advantage of, of the offers from Aura. It's all listed below. Appreciate you guys, and tune in next time to Southeastern 14.